Welcome to Promise Church. It's so wonderful to have you all here tonight. Even though there's just a few of us, it's going to be a nice, it's, it's sometimes nice when there's just a few of us because then it's just nice and intimate and small and all that. But we're really glad that each one of you have come tonight and anyone who's watching online, that's amazing as well. I'm Timothy Place, the pastoral intern here at Promise Church, and I'd like just to open us up with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you that we have the privilege to come together and worship you, that we get to know you. I thank you for your son and that you die on the cross for our sins, that we get to be children of God and how amazing that is. And I ask that you would just let us see you tonight, that we would just see you in a deeper way, in a fresh way, that we'd encounter your love and your truth, and that you would just change us, that we would look just at you and that your images be reflected back on us and the areas of our lives that need to be changed or confronted, that you would just do that in our lives. And God, I ask as we're going to be praying tonight after the service that you would just show up in an undeniable way and just move in our midst and just meet people where they're at and just speak to them. Amen. Hopefully all of you had a really good week. It was really hot this week, so that actually meant that I got a day off because it was going to feel like a hundred and something. And we were like, let's not, let's not work on top of houses and up on windows and all those kind of things. So I got a day off. So maybe the rest of you guys either got to, hopefully you got to work inside or not work outside on Wednesday. Because it was, you know, you could probably boil an egg on the pavement or something. But anyway, if you guys would all like to greet each other, that'd be wonderful. forgetting people. <laughs> oh, it's okay, Justin. Anyway, now we can continue on with our announcements for today. So, first we have our tithes and offerings. So you can give both at our Venmo or at the online or by the QR code right here, or you can give in the back by um, check or cash. And I just encourage all of you guys to just pray about this and just remember tithing and just being faithful with that because it's something that's important to do in your lifestyle, especially when it comes to trust and trusting God, you know, especially when times are tight or hard. Our mindset shouldn't be, oh, I'm going to make sure everything works out and then give to God. It's like, no, 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 no. God comes first, and we give to him first, and then we follow him, and if we're following him, then God will take care of everything else. So I encourage all of you guys just to embrace a lifestyle of tithing. Our next announcement is Kingdom Builders, which is our over and above giving, which I also encourage all of you guys to do the tithing. That's great, but it's also amazing to live a lifestyle of generosity both you know, through kingdom builders, this is the way that we give to different organizations and people or just bless people in the church. Um, we're, we're focusing on Lake Geneva Christian Center. We have been for a while this year. But I just want to encourage all you guys to be generous, to be looking and praying for those ways, either kingdom builders or other things, where God can just use you to bless someone. And just remember that our finances as individuals or as families, aren't just our own. And when we become Christians, it becomes God's money, not my money. Yeah. So just be open to God being like, you know, bless that person, give that person money, or pay for that person's meal, or just all these different ways that we can step out in just generosity and just let God love people through us and through our finances. And a great way to do that is to give towards the kingdom builders where they're building a new 
whole facility to have people go up there and, um, and do their camps and things for the youth and for the kids and for family camp and the different conferences. So you can also just give the same ways um, as I stated earlier for the tithe, but just designate it for the kingdom builders. Next announcement we have is, and they changed the order on me again, Miracle Saturday is what we're going to be focusing on again today, which we're going to be doing this pretty much the last week of every month. You know, and God can heal people. God can do miracles any, any day of the week, any moment. But we as a church just want to be being in a place where we're seeking God to move in miraculous ways. And as we're being intentional in that, we're setting aside these Saturday nights once a month just to seek God for miracles um, in the lives of people in the church. So after church, we're going to be praying for people and um, just encourage you guys to join in that and pray for people and you know, bring your prayer requests as well at the end of the service. Next announcement we have is Christ Cones, which is what I thought we were going to last time. I don't know what it is with me and my notes. I just get things rearranged. This coming Wednesday is going to be our final Christ Cones outreach. So if you've never been, this is your week. You know, otherwise, you have to wait till next summer, uh, which is you know, a while from now. So I really encourage you guys. We've had a really great summer. We've had lots of good conversations with people and lots of um, smiles from kids who have gotten ice cream and just been able to love on them. So I encourage you guys to come out. You can scoop ice cream. You can talk to people. Um, there's so many things you can do. But we as Christians are called to the Great Commission, to go out and preach the good news of Jesus to the world. And I just encourage you guys, this is a great way and a really safe way to, you know, kind of just enter into that. Maybe you've never done it before, or maybe you've done it a hundred times, but just come out and preach the gospel and love on people through Christ's cones. And that'll be this Wednesday. We'll meet at 6.30 and pray till about um, 7, and then we're going to go down to City Square Park and give out ice cream there. So hopefully there'll be lots of people. The next one we have is prayer and praise and fasting. So I said that the opposite as the screen, which hopefully didn't throw anyone off. Um, but this coming week, we're going to be switching to the next month, which is crazy to me. August is over. Where did our summer go? I don't know. Time just keeps flying by. But what we do every month is the first week of that month, we do fasting from Wednesday night to Thursday night, and then we finish it off with prayer and praise at the Sullivan's house. So I encourage all of you um, to participate in fasting. Because uh, if you guys remember the story when, the, I think, I don't remember who it was, but people were coming up to Jesus and asking, like, why aren't your disciples fasting? Like, everyone else does that. That's the thing you're supposed to do. And Jesus has this, you know, analogy about when you're with the bridegroom, you don't fast. But then he says, but they will fast when Jesus goes to heaven. And he didn't say they could fast or they, maybe they should, but he says they will. And I think that's important because Christ is telling us that we, we should be fasting. So I really encourage you to incorporate this fast, especially as the whole church is doing it together. That's something powerful about that. Just encourage you guys to join in that fasting and be obedient in that. So. Also come to prayer and praise. It's a wonderful time. Also, we're going to have a guest speaker on October 7th. The name is familiar, but there's no relation. It's Austin Sullivan, who's a missionary. They're going to the United Arab Emirates. He is actually a local from Oconee and graduated from Oconee High School in 2009. So they're locals around here, and they're going to the UAE to preach the gospel to those people there. So we're going to hear about them and their story, and I just encourage you guys to come and be encouraged and just hear about what God's doing in that country. And that'll be October 7th for the Austin Sullivans. And it'll be a very confusing, you know, Saturday, because we'll be like, which Sullivans are we talking about here? Anyway, and finally, we have a Mexican potluck on October 14th, so the following week after that. So I encourage all you guys to bring your favorite dish and have fun and, you know, eat lots of food, but probably not too much food, which I might do anyway. Um, 
Justin's laughing. He's like, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, it's going to be a great time of fellowship and just being able to chat with people and have a lot of good fun over food. So now we are going to do our scripture memory verse. for the month, which is, this is our last, last week doing it, so we better all have it memorized. So, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Exodus 20, verse 8. Well, good evening. How are we doing? Good? Bad? This is like a crowd participation thing. So good, bad, ugly, right in the middle. That's good. I'm, I'm right about here as well. So it's been, it's been a pretty good week. So, um, but now we get to go into the presence of the Lord um, in, in song. And not that we don't do that other places or that we don't do that throughout our week as well. But this time we're going to corporately go together into his presence. Um, and so... The reason that we sing is because of all of he did for us, all the stuff that he did for us, all the things that he's saved us from, all the things that he's protected us from. The theme for this week, I feel like for this set, is just protection. And the God who saved us is the God that also protects us. God has many different things to many different people and to many different, in many different circumstances. He's the same God, but he has different attributes. And today, the God is in, today, God is the protector. We're going to focus on that and the way that he's protecting us from ourselves at times and from different things in our week. And so would you stand as we begin worshiping him together?
is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. And I've never been more glad that I you for being our foundation that we can put our trust in. You're a rock that will not fail. And you're a rock that will stand strong when the waves come. When the waves and winds come, God, you will stand strong. And so will we if we're standing on you. If we build our house, if we build our life upon you, God, you will protect us. Thank you for doing that. Hold me now in the hands. 
things that created the heaven. Find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars. You pulled me from the clay, set me on a rock, called me by your Lifted up and my knees know it's all for your glory that I might stand with more reasons to sing than to fear you pulled me from the clay set me on a rock called me by
us to leave everything at your feet today. We love you. We ask you to bring our worries and desires to you and to leave them at your feet. Lord, help us to meet you right now. guys to take a bold step. Would you, if you feel comfortable, would you leave the physical place where you're at right now and move somewhere in the room that's abnormal to where you normally would? For me, I like to sit in that back corner. And so for me, maybe I'd move somewhere else. I'm tied to a piano, so I'm not going to do that right now. (laughs) But Would you take a moment and just as a declaration of not staying where you're at with God, would you move somewhere else and worship him in another location than maybe you normally would? If that means pacing the whole room, that means pacing the whole room. If that means moving to another chair, so be it. If that means moving from the back to the front or from the front to the back, do that. And just worship him with everything. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We honor you. We honor you. Help us to hear you, Lord. Help us to hear you, Lord. Help us to hear you, Lord. and forgiven. Healed and forgiven. Look where my chains are now. Death has no hold on me because your grace holds that ground. Healed and forgiven. Look where my chains are now. Death has no hold on me, cause your grace holds that ground, and your grace holds me now. 
grace holds me now. Your 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 grace holds me now. Lord, you protect us even when we don't have the energy to do so ourselves. Sometimes you try to do everything on your own. Sometimes you're going to try to take on too much. Or even the things that you're supposed to be doing, you try to take it all. If you're like me, you don't like asking for help. But Lord, we need your help today. We need your help to even just live our lives because if we didn't have you, then there'd be no relationship. Lord, we honor you. Lord, take this worship Take this worship and make it perfect. Because, Lord, by, by itself, it's not perfect. It's not what you deserve. Lord, from each of us individually and all of us together, Lord, make this worship perfect. Lord, make it what you desire. We honor you and we love you and you deserve the best. you, Lord. Last week, we sang a song called Thank You, and it does just that. It, we thanks, it thanks Him, and we thank Him for what He's done. So we 
sing thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we sing thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we sing thank you, thank you, oh thank you, thank you. us so much to go to the cross for us. Thank you, thank you. Beautiful Savior. Thank you, thank you, selfless sacrifice. After all that I've done, you still love me. After all that we've done, after all the mistakes that we've made, you still love us. And you've poured out your love for us. So thank you, God, for that. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping. Thank you for taking that bold step of worshiping him together. I'll start by saying uh, thank you. Uh, I was gone last week, and I appreciate the, having a great leadership team, being able to step in, trust them to, to do everything that needs to be done. Um, our intern pastor bringing the message, great job. And just, I mean, so I say thank you there. Diane and I were, uh, you know, away in San Francisco and then to uh, three hours north of San Francisco in a town called Point Arena. Uh, the, uh, it's where my, my nephew, I was able to officiate my nephew's wedding ceremony there, got married. Uh, we're from Minnesota, so we like talking about the weather, right? So uh, I don't know what it was a week ago today, but, I mean, it was, it was warm before we left. It was warm when we got back. You know, Timothy talked about it being like 
it's like 96, 98, Wednesday, Thursday. The high in Point Arena on Saturday was 67 degrees. I mean, that's the, the coast of California. You're right on the ocean there. Um, the, uh, the, they got married on Saturday, and the sun never broke through. It was, you know, woke up in the morning, and it was, it was foggy. And um, I went for a run, and I was more wet from the wet mist of the, the ocean than perspiration. It was just, it was like 50 degrees, you know, and just, you know, you got all this mist in the air. It was, and so we, we had a, um, Diane didn't enjoy the cooler temperatures, but I certainly did. Um, and uh, we spent some time with family prior to going up to Point Arena. I have a lot of family that lives in San Francisco. I was able to spend some time with them and do some touristy things, uh, you know, go to see the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, Ghirardelli Square. Where in Ghirardelli Square, they have four Ghirardelli shops, like four separate shops. There's other things in the square, like you can, they've got other stores and other things going on. But as part of that, they have four separate locations where you can buy chocolate and ice cream. Um, I have a chocolate Ghirardelli fountain. I'm like, I want one of those for my house, man. I just... You know, just go over and just take your cup, you know, in the morning. Forget coffee, just like, oh, just a fountain of chocolate. All right, I'm ready to go. Um, so we had a good time, and, and we appreciated uh, people stepping in and being away. So uh, thank you for that. Congratulations. I, is, I see Rachel is uh, when, so is your daughter here as well somewhere in the building? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Show her off, man. Uh, I don't think you want her necessarily exposed to everybody's germs, but we're glad you brought her. What a beautiful little girl, man. Congratulations to you and Roland. Wow. Add to your, your family. I, you know, uh, I don't know if Judah's happy to have her or not, if he wants to trade her in or, you know, what goes on with that. Um, one clarification. I, I don't know that I had someone ask me during the announcements. So praise, prayer, and fasting. It's kind of may, might be a little off. The last day of August is next Thursday, but praise, prayer, and fasting is actually the week after that. It's the first week of September. I don't know what day that is, but it's not this coming week, but the week after. All right, let's pray again. Jesus, we bless you tonight. What a privilege to be in, in a place where we can worship you, come together as the body of Christ, as the people of God, and uh, worship you and serve you and just give you glory and honor. Be here in the in the message, speak through my words, Lord God. I pray that uh, you would just touch people and speak to them in their situations and their scenarios, whether they're here in the room or they're watching online. We ask all that in your name. Amen. Uh, we're in a, a message series in First Peter, uh, Endure Suffering Well. Some people believe you come to faith in Christ and you're not supposed to suffer. And Peter in his first epistle makes it really clear that suffering is part of the Christian life and that's not abnormal. Uh, as I said previously, you know, the book of Job in probably the whole Bible, you know, if you're looking for a book that wants to emphasize suffering, Job is that book. If you want just one from the New Testament, that's First Peter. That's one of the themes that comes through in the book of First Peter is you will have suffering, endure suffering, endure suffering. Well, in fact, God has a purpose for it in your life. It's not accidental. He will use it. He will use it in many different ways. And uh, so that's First Peter. Now, as we get to the second chapter tonight into the book, one of the things that Peter brings into emphasis in that second chapter is uh, bring your spiritual, don't just float in your spiritual life. Don't just coast in your spiritual life. You can't put your spiritual life on cruise control. You can go down the highway in your car and go, you know what, I've got the right speed. This is the speed I want to be going and hit the button and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set it on cruise. Now you got cars, I don't have one of these, right? Where you can get, get autopilot, like you could take your hands off the wheel what 
first, what Peter is saying in 1 Peter chapter 2 is you cannot do that with your spiritual life. You need to move closely to him. I've taught, titled the message tonight, Serve Him Closely. That you need to engage, always be engaged in your spiritual life. Don't just take your hands off the wheel. Be engaged in it. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses, verses 2 and 3 say, Like newborn infants. Oh, man, we have one here in the house tonight. Wow. Like newborn infants crave spirit, pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The first thing I put in there is create right cravings. He says there, crave pure spiritual milk. And, you know, you think about that. And first blush, the admonition to crave crave pure spiritual milk seems like contrary to the way we are as humans and the way cravings work in our life. Uh, they, they seem to be things that, cravings seem to be things we don't control. I mean, I don't know if Rachel, if you went through this uh, when you're pregnant, that, you know, when you're pregnant, uh, there are hormones that go through your body that are not there when you're not pregnant. And they're there, there's hormones that you have that just change the, the amount that are there. You have more of certain hormones. You've got hormones that are not normal. And part of that process of being pregnant and having these things go through your body is like it creates cravings for things that you're like, I, again, I've not experienced this. I'm not a woman, but I've lived with a woman who experienced those cravings, right? Uh, Diane, when she was pregnant with Nicole, craved cherries, the problem for her was she was craving cherries and it was January, right? So, you know, in the frozen tundra, there's nary a cherry to be found in January, right? You know, they're just not going to, you can crave it all you want, but you go to the grocery store, they're not, this is not cherry season. And, but she was craving those things. And a newborn babies don't eat solid food. They have to consume milk from mom or, you know, some alternative to that. But they eat milk, and they eat from growing it, and they grow quickly. And growth is stunted if they don't eat enough. And they have an inborn and created desire to consume breast milk, right? They, mom is where they get food and where they're, they're, they're born with that desire for that. You don't have to teach them that. They are born with it. So cravings, when, when Peter writes this, it seems to be like, what are you talking about, Peter? Cravings are something that are just there or not there. They seem beyond our control. But you can eliminate cravings by stopping eating things. You know, you, you can have a craving. Uh, you know, my dad was a smoker for a, long, for a long time in his young adult life. Like, he grew up in the smoking era, right? You, he could smoke in the office and he'd smoke three packs a day, you know, in, in his young adult life, just sit there at the office, smoke a cigarette, put it out in the attic, and, and there, there was like a cloud of smoke in the room. Like, that, that's the way he was. And when he stopped smoking, he had cravings for cigarettes because he had developed a taste and his body had developed probably an addiction, I would say, to nicotine. I don't know, but that's the way nicotine works. And, and there was a craving for that. But now that he hasn't smoked cigarettes probably in, in 50 years, you would ask him, it's like, I have no craving for cigarettes. It's not like you know, he's trying to fight off this craving because he hasn't done it in so long that it's just not there anymore. So you can create cravings or extinguish cravings based on your own behavior by making the cho choices you have. Um, has anyone here been to Australia? Australia Australians have this, this spread called Vegemite. I had an Australian friend and, and he brought it in one time and, and I tasted it and it's, I'm, they, Australians, they, they love this stuff. It's like peanut butter to them. You know, it's, but to me, it kind of tastes like a soy sauce. You know, like you're putting soy sauce on your, your breakfast bread. But you go to, to Australia and they grow up with it. That's what they eat. They, and Vegemite sandwich is part of like you put a little bit of that on your toast in the morning and you have a Vegemite sandwich, right? So that's what you do. 
I mean, if you go to Hawaii, Hawaiians eat spam, right? I have not eaten spam I, like in forever. Like I can't tell you the last time I had spam. Hawaiians eat 7 million cans of spam a year. That comes, I mean, spam comes from Minnesota. I live in Minnesota. I don't eat spam. Hawaiians eat spam. Like they average eating five cans of spam, like per person. That's per year. That's a lot of, to me, that's a lot of spam. And that's not counting people who are like there and like, I'm not eating any spam. Because after World War, during World War II, they had the GIs there and the uh, government sent them spam. Well, it kind of integrated into their culture. So they started eating spam and and they kept eating spam, and they taught their kids how to eat spam. And so now a part of their diet is, regular part of their diet is spam. So you can create or eliminate cravings based on what you choose to do, what you choose to eat, what you engage in. Uh, in World War II, again, the uh, government of the United Kingdom had this phrase that they used, a motivational poster they produced called, Keep Calm and Carry On. And the poster was intended to raise morale of the British public in the face of predicted attacks. In verse 4 of 1 Peter, this, this, these verses we read, it says that God is good. See, the, like I say, the, the theme, one of the, the theme that we've captured in 1 Peter is endure suffering well. And here's something I want to tell you. He's like, God is good even when you suffer. See, some people say, how could a good God allow suffering? Well, those things are two separate things. Sufferings come into your life. The world is broken. There's suffering there. God is good. Those things are not in conflict with one another, and they can exist together. And Peter tells you that, right? In verse 4, God is good. You will suffer, and God is, remains good. A second theme in Peter's book is the temporaries of life and the permanence of the afterlife. He encourages us that although suffering may seem long and suffering may seem permanent, but it is temporary. And in actuality, suffering is short and momentary. And he's like, God is good. And he puts there that you've tasted the goodness of God. He's not saying you will taste. It's not a future tense. He's not saying you're doing it right now, but you have tasted. You have experienced with God to tell you that God is good. And certainly when you begin the walk with Jesus Christ, I think that's where people start to experience it for the very first time. Because you experience the goodness of having sin removed from your life. I mean, you don't have to be a slave trader like, you know, the uh, Amazing Grace, that said, the writer of Amazing Grace is right, said that um, I, I was lost and now I'm found. He experienced the goodness of God. He's like, I've done horrible things. I've moved and traded in other human beings. I was lost, but now I'm found. But that song resonates with every generation because people recognize I was lost. And now I'm found. And when you go from being lost to being found, you're like, I've tasted the goodness of God. I, I had sin. I, had, I, was con I was contaminated with sin. It was all over me. But God removed that contamination from me so I can now taste the goodness of God. Peter says, you've tasted the goodness of God. So he says, pursue Pure spiritual milk. Change your cravings as you mature in your faith. He's like, don't just coast in your faith. Don't just set your faith on autopilot, but learn to crave pure spiritual milk. And how do you create a craving? By ingesting that very thing. So how do you create a craving for pure spiritual milk? Go after pure spiritual things. Be in his word. Memorize his word. Be around people who are excited for Jesus. You're like, I want, I want that in my life. How do you create an appetite for it? How do you make sure your, your spiritual life doesn't just get stuck in a cruise control? Because if it's stuck there, you know what? You are, you're going to start to drift. You're going to drift away from the Lord. So you need to be intentional about creating the craving in your life, about saying, I'm going to be engaged. I'm not going to let my, my spiritual life coast. I'm going to continue to work on it. I'm, going to, I'm not going to just stop. I'm not going to just do those things. I'm going to be engaged in it. 
We become motivated to do what we should because we've experienced the goodness of God. It's like, I, I, I experienced it. He's like, you've, you've tasted. You know God is good. So engage your spiritual life. And then he goes on in the second part of 1 Peter chapter 2 in these next verses to talk about you being a spiritual house. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be holy to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you were not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Justin and I didn't talk about my message or theme for my message, but I love when the Holy Spirit just works those things out because the song's talking about stone, Jesus being the firm foundation, a stone on which we build our faith. And Peter says in here that he is a living stone. Jesus is alive. He's the foundation of our faith, is a living Christ. He is the stone that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. That's Isaiah 28, verse 16. And this is what I love about when I look at this passage is, again, Peter is writing in about 60 A.D., He's writing from Jerusalem. He's writing to Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And he is writing to a primarily non-Jewish audience. But he wants them to understand that their faith that they're walking in is not a new thing. It's not a new faith. But it is a faith that is ancient, and it's tied to the Old Testament Scriptures. Peter quotes five separate and different Old Testament passages in this chapter. I did the calculation myself. About one quarter of this chapter is quotes from the Old Testament. All of the quotes are prophetic words regarding Christ. And the first three that you read in this chapter are quotes about him being the cornerstone. The people who believed in him and put their trust in him will never be put to shame. So he's telling these people in Asia Minor, you have come into an ancient faith which has a cornerstone that was prophesied about in the Old Testament. And he came here and you're placing your faith in Jesus Christ, that cornerstone. That is a firm foundation for you because people will place their faith in many things and a lot of different things. People will place their faith in education, the attainment of knowledge. Make sure you, people will say, make sure you go to college and get that learning. That learning will provide you skills so you can live happy and fulfilled. People will say, oh, put your faith in physical fitness. Work diligently to eat right and exercise so you can have a healthy future. Put your, your future in finances, acquiring money and using money well so that you ensure that you have a fulfilled life or experiences. I mean, the current generation, a lot of them wants to reach far places of the, the, the earth and the world and take various adventures and do various things. I mean, we saw this a lot in the, in the parts of California that we were in. You know, they talk about van life, right? People living and traveling and, and existing in a van. Why do they want to do that? Because they want the experience of being able to, to kind of move and, and live in different places and sleep in different places overnight and, and live that way. We're, walk, we're driving up, a, you know, a Highway 5 in, 
California, which is this curvy road that runs along the coast. And you got people not the van life, they got like bike life. They're going up and down these hills and around these curves, and they got their backpack on the back of their bike, right? They're going to camp out somewhere. <laughs> They're looking for an experience. And none of those things are bad, but those are bad things if you're going to put your foundation in those things. If you're going to center your life on any of those things, you will be disappointed. Those are bad cornerstones. See, the foundation stone for the Old Testament temple was carefully chosen and was a costly, and with its placement in Jerusalem, the city of God, it was put there, and they built it there. And Peter says, Jesus is the foundation for this new temple, which is not a physical temple, but a spiritual house. And he's like, build your life on the one person who is immovable and unchangeable and is far than anything that is far less enduring. Don't put your faith in any of those other things that you can. Those things that people say, oh, this is what you want to do with your life. This is the most important thing in your life. They say, no, no, no. Jesus. Peter says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus is the foundation. Cornerstone is that, that when we don't build buildings that way, but when they build masonry buildings or they build rock buildings like they did in ancient times, they would look for a stone and that would be the one that they would be like, this is going to be the one that we put everything against. We're going to have two walls come together. And this stone is going to be the one that provides the direction for that wall, for that wall, and for upward. Everything has to be in line with that corner stone. You got to have to have it exactly there because everything else doesn't matter. You know, you're not lining up to the stone next to you. You're lining up to the stone at the corner. That's how you build brick buildings. That's how you build masonry and, and stone structures. And, and Peter, it finds to me is like, I find, again, this is what I found fascinating about this chapter is Peter was called the rock, right? I mean, Jesus called Peter the rock. It's like, Peter, you are the rock on which the church will be built. And Peter doesn't reference that anywhere in this epistle. Yeah, that Jesus, I think Peter recognized Jesus is the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. And Peter saw his life as simply being a stone adjacent to the cornerstone. He's going to be another living stone. And he sees the rest of the church being built up around the chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ. He's adjacent. He's there. He's doing his ministry. He's going to give up his life. But he's like, all of the rest of you are part of that structure. Line yourself up with the cornerstone. You are living stones. You're not simply an inanimate object. You're part of the structure. You're part of the spiritual house. Engage. Put yourself in alignment with the rock. Your faith is built on the living stone. Christ, you yourselves are part of that building. And he provides a contrast to those who are not part of the building. He's like, those who are, you are followers of Christ. You that I'm writing to, you are living rocks. You are part of that structure. But those who have chosen not to be part of the structure, they stumble over the cornerstone. They, they trip on it. I'm going to tell you about the worst trip I experienced in my life. You know, usually when you trip, you kind of stumble, you maybe catch yourself, uh, or maybe if you actually fall down, you know, you kind of brace yourself, hit your knees, you hit your legs. I think I was like 14 or 15, and I was in a friend's backyard, and we're playing Frisbee, and I wasn't really familiar with the friend's backyard. I hadn't been there very often, and they, they throw the Frisbee to me, and I'm chasing the Frisbee down, and it's above my head, right? So I'm looking... And I'm about to catch the Frisbee, and bam, I go down. Because I'm looking up. And in the corner of their yard, they had the sandbox, which they were not using much anymore because, you know, obviously 14 and 15-year-olds don't play in a sandbox. But this wooden frame sandbox was in the corner. And as I was going to catch that Frisbee, I caught the lip of that, that sandbox because I, I did not see it at all. I did not catch myself. I did not brace myself. I just hit, and there wasn't much sand left in the sandbox. It was like a little bit of sand on top of a wood box. 
I mean, I just, I just scraped up. I got like blood and stuff. It was just, just I fell. When I, when I read what Peter is describing here about those who stumble over Christ, that is what they completely reject Christ and they stumble on him. They can't handle him. And in the end, their lives will reflect that type of fall. They will fall because they have rejected the cornerstone. When you who have placed your faith in Christ are added to that building, you're not dead stones, but you are living rocks. And when you misplacing your faith in Christ, you are going to face the worst trip of your life. You hear the word, but they do not obey it, and they will fall, and they will fall mightily. And the final thing Peter says here is a, that you are a holy priesthood. And he makes this transition. He adds this element of this to his comparison. Not only are you living rocks in a spiritual house, but you're holy priests. Man, that's quite an opportunity for his followers. Because Old Testament, in order to be a priest, you had to be an Israelite to start with. You had to be male. And if you were too young, you couldn't serve. Too old, you were retired. You know, you, and then you had to be a descendant of Aaron. You couldn't be of any tribe. You had to be a descendant of Aaron. You had to be a Levite in order to be a, a, a priest. And now Peter is saying, you're a priest. You, you don't need anyone else to go to God for you. I mean, he is here. This is what Martin Luther in the Reformation said, the priesthood of every believer. You can serve before the Lord. You can go before the Lord. You don't need anyone else to go into that presence for you. You are now a priest following Jesus yourself. Peter makes that bold pronouncement to these believers in Edomite. You are part of the priesthood. You don't need another priest. And like the Old Testament priests, that are, these followers are making sacrifices, not of a grain or animal variety, but spiritual sacrifices. You're not simply an outsider who watches other people doing important things in worship. You're an active participant in the most critical elements of worship and the spiritual rituals. And so what are the spiritual sacrifices that Peter says you can offer? He doesn't put them here, but these are three things that I think of. Number one, your life. Paul said in Romans chapter one, Romans chapter 12, verse one, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Part of what Paul is saying is that everything you do can be an act of worship. Everything you can do, you're not just acting here in church as a spiritual act of worship, but he's like, you are a offering yourself in everything you do. You, com you program a computer, you're offering it to the Lord as spiritual worship to him. You eat something or drink something. You're, it's part of your worship to him. You read a book. You run a chainsaw. My favorite way to worship, right? I'm doing it as an act to the Lord, right? And Diane's like, stop doing that. Don't worship that way. That's a dangerous way to worship. I'm like, this is a great way to worship, you know? Yeah, this fuel smell on, it's loud. I got my uh, goggles on. I got my ear protection on. I'm like, I'm worshiping the Lord, right? Everything we do, he says, living sacrifice. You shoot a basketball. You bag your groceries. He's like, do it as an act of worship to God. Second way is praise and thanksgiving. The writer of Hebrews tells us to offer up a sacrifice of praise. When we worship him with words and in song, we are bringing a sacrifice of praise. When we acknowledge him as Savior and King, it is a sacrifice of praise. It's so cool to be able to do that. When you say, Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, I love you. You are bringing as your, in your priesthood believing way, you are bringing a sacrifice to God, a sacrifice of praise. And certainly, it's a lot less messy than bringing an ox in and sacrificing an ox. So I'm so happy that we can be able to offer sacrifice that way. You can do it corporally together as the body, or you can do it alone, anywhere. Gifts. Some of you might have brought meals to roll into Rachel to help them as they welcome their new daughter in. And, and as part of that, that is, a, a, that is a act of worship. That is a sacrifice, a gift to God. Paul said when the Philippians gave him a gift for his ministry, he called that a fragrant offering. A gift. They were giving a fragrant offering. They were bringing something to the Lord. 
When you give over and above the kingdom builders, it's a spiritual sacrifice. You're bringing something to the Lord and in your priesthood. You're saying, God, I'm a priest before you. I'm coming as an act of worship and I'm bringing you a sacrifice. I'm bringing you something here to worship with you. And the beauty of your priesthood is that you don't need to take, have anyone else take it for you. You get to take it before the Lord yourself. You can, make, you can approach the throne. You can approach the altar. And Peter wants you to lean in to the transformation that God has done in your life. He says, desire pure milk. He's like, create that craving in your life. Don't just be satisfied with your spiritual life right where it's at. Don't let your spiritual life start to lose its motivation and lose its energy. Lean into it. Crave pure spiritual milk. Create that within you. You're saying, don't just take the cravings that have been given to you. You can create a new craving. He's like, do that in your own life. B, he wants you to be part of the spiritual house built up to God. You are a living stone. He's, Christ is the cornerstone, and you're one of the living stones in that spiritual house built to God. And he wants you to be a priest offering sacrifices to God. You were once not part of God's people. Now you are. Once you did not receive God's mercy, now you do. Stand with me as we close. Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight. And we don't want to have our spiritual lives simply be on autopilot. We don't want our spiritual lives simply to be adrift. We want to be engaged in our spiritual life. Creating craving for the things of God. Creating desire for what you are the good things that you've put in our life, Lord God, the things that you spiritually want to do in our life, Lord God. Lord, if we're here tonight and, we, and our spiritual life has, has been put on autopilot or maybe we've neglected it altogether and we haven't engaged it the way we should, whether there's someone in the house or whether they're watching online, Lord God, tonight I call them and say, engage your spiritual life. Crave pure spiritual milk. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful too. have the benediction we're going to shut down the online part of our service but we're going to pray and if you need a miracle tonight you want prayer we're going to have people who are willing to pray for you tonight after this benediction and then we're going to continue to worship for a while just allowing ourselves to soak in the presence of the lord lord jesus we come to you tonight we thank you for the opportunity to be together as the body of christ i pray you bless your people i pray lord that we would leave here engaged in our spiritual life more fully, more intentionally, craving the pure spiritual milk that Peter writes about. Bless your people, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.